Why are you locked in the bathroom? But no one asked why. Maybe you should try getting a job. The Bluetooth device is connected us successfully. Hello and welcome back to Wish for Death Island and welcome back to another edition of how many Kirby's can I fit into the frame at once. Today we're going to be talking about terrible terrible things. Mm, God never allows pain without a purpose! Oh <laughs> now I know some of you immediately looked at this and were like, I remember that. And if you did, that's probably because you follow some sort of true crime thing like you know in general you probably follow the case you probably just remember it because it's on your brain more than other people what i'm trying to say with this is that there are a lot of people who are watching it and then immediately forgetting about it and then people who actually believe what casey anthony said and they're just walking around thinking that like she didn't do anything wrong and that's an issue there's also another group of you who are like remember what what are you talking about who is casey anthony oh boy I'm disintegrating! by the way those two prints in the background over there are from my shop which now has new clay pieces as well and i also fixed the links to my spoopy book on the amazon thing in the description just saying let's start with casey anthony and why i hate her why are you locked in the bathroom you talking to me Maybe you should try getting a job. On July 16th, 2008, a woman by the name of Cindy Anthony calls the police and she sounds absolutely distraught, obviously. And we can find out why. What's your emergency? I called a little bit ago. The deputy says I found out my granddaughter has been taken. She has been missing for a month. We're talking about a three-year-old little girl. My daughter finally admitted that the baby's in the store. I need to find her. Your daughter admitted that your ba the baby is where? But the babysitter took her a month ago. My daughter's been looking for her. I told you my daughter was missing for a month. I just found her today, but I can't find my granddaughter. And she just admitted to me that she's been trying to find her herself. There's something wrong. I found my daughter's car today, and it smells like there's been a dead body in the damn car. Okay, what is the three-year-old's name? Kaylee. C-A-Y-L-E-E. -E, Anthony. Kaylee Anthony? Yes. How long has she been missing for? I have not seen her since the 7th of June. Is your daughter there? Yes. Can I speak with her? The confused operator is trying to keep up with what she's saying and she doesn't really know what's going on so she finally calms Cindy down and asks her what the fuck is happening. Cindy tells us a story. Cindy is the mother of a woman named Casey Anthony. Casey Anthony has a daughter named Kaylee. Casey is about 22 and Kaylee is two years old. The father is currently not in the picture. The last time that Cindy Anthony had seen either of these family members was around one month ago in the previous month, June, around the 7th. Every time that she tried to contact Casey, Casey was like, well, I'm really busy right now and I'm staying with other people and Kaylee is really busy and Kaylee's not really available. It was suspicious. Now, obviously, sometimes family members get busy and that's perfectly fine, but Casey had a history of lying, so ultimately, it was more suspicious than you would think. Nevertheless, Cindy and George, her husband, Casey's father, had made efforts because that's just what you do. And Casey had lived with her parents, so ultimately, it's also like, well, now she's away from her parents, you don't really know where she's living, and she has a two-year-old, it's a problem. Really, you can only make excuses for so long before it starts to get a bit fishy. When I say it wasn't out of the ordinary for Casey to lie, I really mean it. Because back when she was in her final year of high school, she actually lied about attending classes at all, and she left and didn't even graduate. Now, when her parents found out that she didn't graduate, they decided to enable her and threw a party and said to everyone who would listen that she did actually graduate instead. So, it wasn't like they were dealing it with it in the most healthy way. But surely, yeah, she's a bit of a liar, but she wouldn't do anything that was downright bad, right? And the business, we call this foreshadowing. On the 16th of July, 2008, George Anthony was at work. He was just having a normal day at work when, in the afternoon, he got a call saying that the family car had been taken to the impound and he needed to do something about it. He goes to inform Cindy about this, he calls home, and everything starts to fall apart. Yes, the family did own the car, but currently Casey was the one who was supposed to be in possession of it. Casey was the one who was apparently using it and going around doing whatever the hell she was doing for work that meant that she can't go and see them with Kaylee. Cindy comments that there was a really, really bad smell in the car. There was something that smelled to her like death, like a dead body. 
and George, being a former police officer, knew that smell pretty well. There was something wrong with the car. So then they decide that it's time to actually go and dig their heels in and find Casey, smoking weed at some boyfriend's house that they don't know, and she reluctantly informs them that she hasn't seen Kaylee for 31 days. Her own daughter had been missing for 31 days and she hadn't told them. She hadn't told her parents about this. She also was just smoking weed as if nothing was wrong. This is when Cindy, being a normal human being, starts to panic and call the police immediately. She forces Casey on the call to actually talk to the operator because Casey isn't even the one who called the police. There's a lot of people who talk about this case and say things like, why didn't Casey immediately call the police? Why did she wait 31 days to call the police when in reality she didn't Call the police at all. It was Cindy who forced her on the call to talk to the operator. You can immediately contrast between Casey and Cindy in the way that they're talking. Casey is really not not there. She's going to do other things. She really doesn't give a shit about her own child, whereas Cindy Cindy's world is falling apart. I'm using Jim Can't Swim's uh, audio and visuals because he has subtitles and it's easier for you guys to read what's happening because of the weird like Cornflakes mic Xbox Live quality that police always have. Answer the question. Hello? Hello? Yes. Can you tell me what's going on a little bit? I'm sorry? Can you tell me a little bit what's going on? My daughter's been missing for the last 31 days. Okay. And you know who has her? I know who has her. I've tried to contact her. I actually received a phone call today now from a number that is no longer in service. I did get to speak to my daughter for about a moment, about a minute. Who has her? Do you have a name? Her name is Zenaida Fernandez Gonzalez. Who is that? Babysitter? She's, she's been my nanny for about a year and a half, almost two years. Why are you calling now? Why didn't you call 31 days ago? I've been looking for her and have gone through other resources to try to find her, which is stupid. I think the officers are here. The officers are there? Yes. But you can immediately tell one of them is rambling because she doesn't know what's important and what's not important in order to save someone who could very well be dead at the time that she's calling and the other one just doesn't care. It's like random bullshit that she just doesn't care about. However, we do get a few unhelpful and confusing things from Casey in this call. One of them being that she used a nanny for about two years and the nanny's name was Zanny the Nanny. And also that she says that Zanny took Kaylee and the reason why she didn't call the police was because she was pursuing other resources, whatever that means, and she just thought that she could handle it herself or something. And also, that she managed to get a hold of Zanny on the phone at one point in time and managed to talk to Kaylee for about one minute so she knows that Kaylee is still alive. I guess one of the resources she pursued was smoking weed with her boyfriend or something. So all of this is news to Cindy because Cindy had absolutely no idea that any of this was happening whatsoever. <laughs> and throughout the following days, Cindy is still left in the dark because Casey is just refusing to give them any details about any of this. It's like Casey says something to hide, even though she says that she really cares about her daughter, she really wants to find her daughter no matter what apparently no matter what means that there are some things that you just don't have to tell about the case and you can just sit on your ass and not do anything while your child is probably dead so immediately this is suspicious not only to the operator but to anyone with a brain so the detectives who are assigned to the case that same day bring casey in as a witness but they're actually treating her like she has information that she's not telling them and they're very suspicious about a week and a half ago do you know a telephone number for him i can find a number for him. I don't know a number offhand. No, I do not. So you met Zenaida through Jeffrey Hopkins? I did. And yes. his son Zach Hopkins, I guess, Zenaida used to watch over Zach? Yes. And when did she start watching over your child? It's been within the last year and a half, two years that she started watching Kaylee. How would you normally drop off, or how would you normally do the exchange with your child and Zenaida? Would you drop the child off? Would she meet you somewhere? I would usually drop her off for yes. a few months. We would go over to Jeff's house. He lived over in Avalon Park. And you would go to Jeff's house why? to drop off Kaylee. That's where Zenaida would go to watch both of the kids. Okay. It was in a nice centralized area. He had a decent sized house. It was good room for the two of them. Go back to your statement. You dropped off Kaylee June 9th and walk me through. You dropped her off to go to work? Mm-hmm. Okay. Get off of work and go from there. I got off of work, left Universal, driving back to pick up Kaylee like a normal day. And I show up to the apartment, knock on the door, nobody answers. So 
I calls the night of the cell phone and it's out of service. I didn't really want to come home. I wasn't sure what I'd say about not knowing where Kaylee was. Still hoping that I would get a call or, you know, find out that Kaylee was coming back so that I could go get her. And I ended up going to my boyfriend Anthony's house. He lives in Sutton Place. Did you talk to Anthony about uh, what happened with Kaylee? No, I did not. Have you talked to anyone about Kaylee, about your incident with Kaylee? Or the Outside fact that of she's missing? A couple people, a couple mutual friends. Who did you talk to about um, it? I talked to Jeff, Jeffrey Hopkins. Mm -hmm. I talked to Juliet Lewis. She's one of my coworkers at Universal. I think part of me was naive enough to think that I could handle this myself, which obviously I, I couldn't. And I was scared that something would happen to her if I did notify the authorities or got the media involved. I'll you know, ask you before we went on tape, and I'll ask you again just to make sure we're clear. Is there anything about this story that you're telling me that is untrue? Or is there anything that you want to change or divert from what you've already told me? No, sir. Throughout all of her interviews, not only this interview, but through a lot of the other ones that are following, she acts like weird she goes between two different moods the one mood is s sort of snarky but at the same time she's like really happy and she's on the same side of the police which is very clearly not the case like they would be actively saying stuff that is kind of a roundabout way of accusing her and then she'd just be sitting there like yep yep i totally get it totally get it but other times when she needs to she kind of switches into this like weird crying defensive type of attitude where she wants to make it look like she's crying because of Kaylee and on Kaylee's behalf but she's clearly crying because she got caught and it's very clear that she sees it as a major inconvenience for her. It's just so frustrating when people who are clearly like killers or something and they do hate themselves and feel remorse but a lot of them are like they pretend that they feel remorse and they pretend that they can't forgive themselves because they make it about themselves and they try to act like no I really didn't mean it I hate myself but it's very not convincing and the thing is it, it makes me think of Jodi Arias and the way that she was like I can't forgive myself for what I've done I hate myself and it's like oh my god Jodi you're so relatable because I also hate you maybe you should join Majestic 12 in a body bag basically in the interrogation Casey blames everything on Zanny. Zanny the nanny was trustworthy at first but then she over the course of two years went from being a trustworthy nanny to suddenly being a weird abductor and disappearing with the child. She says that she came across Zanny because she worked at Universal for a while and one of the people that she knew from where she worked was called Jeff and Jeff had his son and Jeff was using Zanny as a nanny because she's such a good nanny that he had to recommend her to Casey because Casey needed a nanny and Casey at one point would go and drop her off at Jeff's house because Zanny prefer preferred babysitting both Jeff's kid and Kaylee at the same house. So she went to Jeff's house a lot and then one of the times she showed up at Zanny's apartment to drop Kaylee off because Jeff had moved away and now she just goes directly to Zanny's apartment and then she goes to pick Kaylee up later and no one's answering the door and Zanny's not answering her phone so now Kaylee's been kidnapped and that's the whole story. She then decides the very rational and, and good good decision to just hide her face because she said that she doesn't want to be that type of girl that is known for not taking care of her daughter so instead of prioritizing her daughter's safety she becomes the girl that doesn't take good care of her daughter and just goes and hides her face and stays with some friends for a while she specifically states that she prioritized her own reputation and the way that she felt over the fact that her daughter was missing and she completely disregarded the first 24 hours that are so important to finding a child and she was like fuck it whatever I'll sort it out later. She also says to the cops that she feels like at the time she genuinely thought she was going to find Kaylee on her own, somehow. She gives no indication of what she was actually doing to look for Kaylee. There were also these two very different type of stories that she was telling where one of them was that she was just laying low and she didn't want to talk and she was hiding her face, but the other story was that she was constantly moving around and trying to look for Kaylee, and she's trying to tell both of these stories at the same time and they just don't make sense. There are many times in this situation where she is being asked directly by the cops is there anything that you're not telling us because if you're not telling us something and you tell us then we'll be able to find her and it will be less stress for you like you, you'll be able to 
sort all of this out. And she says, no, it's, it's fine. Like, I'm being totally truthful. She was then asked, if Jeffrey had a son, then why did he just move away completely fine without any incident? And why was Kaylee the one that was taken? And she had so many opportunities to take Jeff's son, but she just didn't do it. And she said that the reason why is because Zanny always talks about how amazing Kaylee was and Kaylee was just the perfect kid and all that kind of stuff. So she kind of sidelines Jeff's son and was like, oh no, but she wasn't really interested in Jeff's son. It's, it doesn't really make that much sense. You said Zanaya had family up in uh, New England, up in New York? Or yes, something? she has family down south, her mother and her sister, um, her brother's in New York, she's originally from New York, pretty much grew up there, moved down here, went to the University of Florida. So then she's asked about the details that she knows about Zanny, and she says she doesn't really know that many details about Zanny, and then gives us a bunch of details. And let me just drop this bombshell right now for you that um, Zanny is not real. What the fuck? Danny was never her babysitter, and Jeff doesn't even have a son, and and that's all of this is nonsense. So when she's describing this whole Wattpad OC about Zanny and like Zanny's family and Zanny's mom's name and Zanny's history and all that kind of stuff, it's all shit that she's made up. She's like making a, a whole like Sims bio about Zanny, like Zanny moves to Pleasant View and is going to be a babysitter for the Caliente sisters. Is this going to work out? What about the history of Bella Goth? Like, it's it's a Wattpad fanfic. She has purple eyes. There's a boy who's a demon and a boy who's an angel, and both are in love with her. Draco Malfoy's there. Like, come on. Time for a lesson, Potter. Let me teach you about wizard crackers. Draco, you idiot, we're all wizard crackers. Not only that, but you know that weird thing that- th There's this weird thing where it's like she has to warm up before she starts crying properly. Like, she has to really focus herself before she starts crying. Like, the whole time she's totally fine. During the interrogation, she's totally fine and she's just chatting with them. But then when they have to talk about Kaylee and she needs to look like a distraught mother, she kind of just warms up and then turns on the crying. And then afterwards, she just drops it. Like, you know when your grandma has an old computer and it takes like 10 minutes to boot up because she has like bonzi buddy and like seven different toolbars open it's it's like that it's like you're just waiting for her to act like a human being she delays it then she tries to do it and then she immediately drops it afterwards so they take her around to all of the addresses that she gave them during the interview and this is where it gets really weird as well because it seems like the majority of the addresses that she gave them about her friends places and zanny's apparent address and the place that jeff used to live all of that's not true it's just random addresses that she picked and she decided that she was going to use police resources when her kid is is dying or dead somewhere and time is of the essence she doesn't care she just fucks around and takes them to random locations because she lied this is becoming especially apparent because she goes to universal she goes all the way to some random room in universal all the way across the, uh, the whole area taking god knows how long to walk there with the police then she just shrugs turns around laughs and goes <laughs> i don't actually work there lol so at this point, the detective pulls her aside and she's like, what the fuck are you doing? Why are you lying? We know you're lying. We have now found out that Jeffrey didn't even really know you and he doesn't have a child. We've now looked into the Stanny person and we can't find any information that she even existed. Casey's reply to this is, well, not everything I said was a lie. So she's implying that some of, if not most of what she said was a lie and somehow this is going to help her child. She even has the gall to talk over them and like get snappy with them as if they're the ones who are doing bad things and not her. And you can tell that they're immediately more distrustful and more negative because they've seen with their own eyes that she's not to be trusted. In a position that doesn't look very good for you. Because obviously I know and you know that everything you told me is a lie, correct? Not everything that I told you. Pretty much everything that you've told me, including where Kaylee is right now. That I still I don't know where she is. Sure you do. And here, here's I absolutely listen, do let me, not let me, know where she let me, is. Let me let me explain something. Looking at you, I know that everything that you've told me is a lie. I am very confident just by having talked to you the short period of time that you know where she is. I legitimately have not seen my daughter in five weeks. I didn't let anything happen to her. Except I trusted her with somebody. Somebody that had been taking care of her, that had been taking good care of her. Someone that she was comfortable with, that I was comfortable what about, with. What about Jeff? You said Jeff worked here about till about two months ago? No, he hasn't worked here for quite a Ten while. Ten months? How long? It's been at least ten months. 
Okay. He got fired in 2002. He hasn't been an employer since 2000. However, to her, the way that she's responding, it's like she's not even having the same conversation. Like, they're just going on and on about how you lied, your kid's in danger, maybe your kid's fucking dead, you don't know, you're trying really, really hard to lie when you should be trying really, really hard to find her and you're suspicious. And then she's replying as if they're not saying those things and they're just saying something else. And then it's such a weird conversation to listen to because it feels like she is so in denial and she is so like strict about control that she is willing to act with complete delusion just for the sake of having what she thinks feels like control. She clearly has no control over the case and about the the interrogation but she's trying like so hard to make it look like she does. And this is what I was talking about before with that weird chipper attitude where she's like no 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 I totally get it I totally get it because it's like she's acting like she agrees with them and then when they're like if you agree with us why aren't you answering our questions and then she gets irritated and she was like why are you being all defensive like I'm agreeing with you so why are you acting like I'm not agreeing with you and it's so childish. So the police do get in contact with Jeffrey and then Jeffrey's like, listen, I don't even have a kid. She worked at Universal in a different department at an entirely different time. So I barely saw her at all. Like I barely talked to her. There was also another coworker that she claimed was her friend and this coworker doesn't exist. Casey is still adamant that Zanny the Nanny is real. And she is like, well, I, I trusted Zanny at one point because she was a nanny for two years and she was really good and now I don't trust her. And it's like, obviously you don't trust her if she took your kid. Also, to point out how she lies, at this point, they obviously know that Jeff didn't work with her per se, but they don't tell her this, and they, they try to sort of throw out a number. So she's like, um, Jeff didn't actually work with me, no, and they're like, he's been moved away now for about, and then she just trails off, and then the officer offers her a number, and he's like, 10 months? Like, to throw her bone, basically, and if she was really telling the truth, she would have said, no, it's more like two years, but she's clearly looking for something to help her with her lie, so she jumps on the number because she thinks that she can use it to like lie more convincingly because he's the one who offered the number to her and she's like yeah yeah 10 months you know what I mean another thing is that she hadn't worked for Universal for like six years as well so I don't know why she took them there so then they're like listen you're lying you are lying and your child is probably dead like <laughs> And, um, like, why are you doing this? And then she's like, I'm running out of options, guys. I don't know what to do. I need to find my daughter. And it's like, you, you're not answering the question, though. She persisted throughout, like, 10 years at this point. Like, the trial was in 2011. We'll get to that. The thing started happening in 2008. All the way up to a documentary, the, the Peacock documentary that I'll talk about later, that aired in 2022, I believe. So... She, like all the way up to that point she was persisting that Zanny is real, Zanny's address was real, the babysitter story is real, this whole thing while her child is god knows where. She also straight up admits that she was more concerned about herself going missing and the, the things that were around her and the way that she felt rather than Kaylee going missing. Like she just admits that basically. She admits that she misled everyone and she tries to spin it around to be like, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing my own thing that is like, you guys don't understand. She also completely ignores the question of like, you knew Zanny took her. So why did you waste all that time when you knew that the person who took her, like, what are you doing? And then the cops ask her like, wh why did you give us all these addresses? And then she goes, well, I was looking at places that were familiar to Kaylee. I wanted to go around to see places that were familiar to Kaylee. Why would that help if you knew who took her and you knew that Kaylee can't just go around on her own because she's two years old? So what's what's happening? So Cindy and George go to the local news because they're obviously trying to get as much manpower as possible and as many people noticing this case and they do a couple interviews from different news stations. They try to get some like resources together to try and make some sort of campaign. They have shirts with Kaylee's face on it and they're, they're trying really hard. In the meantime, Casey is in jail for a while. She's like in a holding cell because they're like trying to still interrogate her and stuff like that. And Cindy and George go to talk to her. And in the prison phone call, Casey does the thing that you've probably seen before if you know who Casey Anthony is. Waste your call. No. Waste my call sitting in the jail. Whose fault is you sitting in the jail? You're blaming me that you're sitting in the jail? Not Blame yourself fault. for telling lies. You mean it's not your fault? What do you mean it's not your fault, sweetheart? If you'd have told them the truth and not lied about everything, they wouldn't... Do me a favor, just tell me what Tony's number is. I don't want to talk to you right now. Well, good, it's going to do you at this point. 
Well, I'd like to talk to him anyway. Okay. Because I called to talk to my mother, and it's f***ing waste. Oh, by the way, I don't want any of you coming up here when I have... Where if I knew where Kaylee was, do you think any of this would be happening? No. He's at my house. Do me a favor, get my brother back because I need Tony's number. Do, does Tony have anything to do with Kaylee? No, nothing. Okay, so why do you want to talk to Tony? He's my boyfriend, and I want to actually try to sit and talk to him because I didn't get a chance to talk to him earlier because I got arrested on whim today. I just want to talk to Tony and get a little bit of... Uh, Casey, uh, you have to tell me if you know anything about Kaylee. If anything if I, happens with Kaylee and Casey, I'll die. You understand? I'll die. If anything happens oh, uh, to that baby. Oh my god, calling you guys? She completely ignores the fact that it is for Kaylee. The, the TV thing wasn't like, you get to be a movie star. It, it's specifically, please help me find my grandchild. That was what the purpose was. You know that, I know that. We, we have brains, but to Casey, that wasn't as important as her being angry that the attention wasn't on her. They also keep saying like, I don't know what involvement you have because you're not telling us what involvement you have. And then Casey responds by saying like, oh, how dare you question me? And it's so annoying. She then asks for her boyfriend's number and she's just yelling at them. She, she is yelling at Cindy, she's yelling at George, she's yelling at her best friend who was on the line, she's yelling at her brother. All of them are like, how is talking to your boyfriend going to help you right now? Because he doesn't know anything and we are actively trying to ask you questions to help us find Kaylee. We're trying to do a campaign. We need you to talk to us and then she's like well i don't want to talk to you i want to talk to my boyfriend because i haven't talked to him in a while and i miss him lol it's like we're at this point where her best friend is crying on the phone about kaylee because she's so worried about kaylee this is how casey should react but casey was not reacting that way see even it was just like well i just feel like talking to my boyfriend so haha <laughs> she also like kind of rapidly switches between like yelling at them about this and like shaking and being like this is so hard on me to just giggling and laughing it's quite creepy actually she also gets told by cindy that the case is now famous and so many people are going to help looking for her so many people are giving her resources so many people want to donate so many people want to do like uh like searches like manpower the, everything normally you've seen normal people react to this and be like wow that's good you know and and casey just looks annoyed at this okay casey you don't realize the whole united states is looking for our kaylee i know that mom her cover is going to be on people magazine in a few days okay raise your eyes up a little bit there you I go so actually now sandy's mom, apartment lee and i already talked about this i don't okay. know it could right. be on on the desk at home. I don't know. What is your... I can't get into your... Um, I gave Lee everything already. I all gave right. Lee all of the passwords, everything we could possibly I think of get, all over again. I want to get some video clips off Kaylee because the video clip with Grandpa is really helping people. Pic okay. Still pictures don't show No, they don't show justice. her personality. Right. And we need to show her personality. So I need to make sure we get that password. Yeah. I gave Lee the password. Please look up, sweetheart. I need to see your eyes. I want to be able to look at you guys, too. I can't look at you and look at the camera. Well, you don't have to look at the camera. Look at me. I'm looking at you. Okay. You're sitting very low. <laughs> Hell. Well, you know something? You, you really need to keep your spirit high for all this. I have. I haven't been crying while I've been in here. Well, you know something? I've been trying to read books and do other things to keep my mind off of stuff. Well, you know, I want to be able to reach out and hug you and give you the, the you know, the big, the big Papa Joe hug. Now, obviously, everyone reacts to grief differently. Some people process grief where they're, like, kind of stoic and then afterwards when they're in private, they break down. Some people immediately break down, especially if you're, like, neurodivergent. Like, some of you might actually be feeling kind of scared sometimes where you're like, what if the police think that I'm guilty because I'm neurodivergent and I'm processing these emotions differently? I, I understand that. I'm not trying to say that Casey's acting weird in the sense that, like, oh, normal people, blah, blah, blah. It's just... In the context of these things and the things that she's saying, in the context of the, the information that we know, it's very clear to see that she's not acting like an innocent person, is what I mean. I'm not trying to act like I'm a body language expert, I'm not bringing that up at all. It, it, that's more what I'm talking about. The the thing that I'm more talking about is just contextually it doesn't make any sense, you know what I mean? So the parents try really hard. The whole through line of this story is that the parents are trying. 
They are trying so hard. They are trying so hard to have a proper human conversation with Casey to try and understand what is happening, to give her so many chances to give her side of the story. And every single time she is meeting them with either like weird, giddy sort of attitude or just shutting them down, calling them idiots, just saying these horrible things. They even ask her, what should we do in terms of like making Kaylee's true personality more evident and what they mean by this is like you know when you're dealing with the public you kind of have to do things to make them remember things like we have to show Kaylee as a human being we have to show her as the child that she was we have to show her like laughing and having good memories and like specific things that make you remember Kaylee so that even if you don't know anything about the case and like years from now you think that you might know something you remember Kaylee because she is so in your mind so they are ask her about that which is a huge deal it's very important and she responds with not helping them at all let me remind you that Casey is a mother whose child might be dead whose child is missing and she's acting like this she disregards everyone on that phone call like you know how I said her brother was calling her her best friend everything she said that they're all clueless and useless very classy the infuriating thing is it's like they are they, they don't understand and that's what's frustrating you you're like they don't understand they don't understand because you are not letting them understand. Do you understand what I'm saying? So her scum attorney, her scumbag scumbag attorney Jose, gets her out of jail like a month later and she's just doing whatever the fuck she wants and then two months later after that point she gets in jail again because they arrest her for murder. And then she has another interrogation and she immediately lawyers up and she's doing the things that Jose tells her to so she's like not really cooperating that much. She's also doing that thing that I mentioned before where she's like trying to pretend that she's on the cop's side but she's also being really blunt and angry at the same time which is really annoying. It's like they're clearly not your friend and you're acting like they are it's like weird yeah. it doesn't say what it's for it doesn't say what case it's in it doesn't mm -hmm. it just says you're subpoenaed to appear before the grand jury well with them announcing that you know there was going to be a grand jury and obviously my name was thrown out they knew who the grand jury was for who threw your name out all the media said that it was from an inside source meaning in here so that's where they all say is I can tell you what I think of the media and what I think of people who leak stuff to the media. I think it's garbage. Yeah. But I agree. <laughs> That's the next thing. That doesn't, way that it, doesn't yeah. make it any less necessary. Without them, mm -hmm. I'll be quite honest, without the media, we don't find a quarter of the kids that we. Oh, I agree. It for. helps. The exposure has helped bring in so many tips for my daughter. But. At the same time, what, mm -hmm. it re what it creates is it creates a monster that otherwise isn't necessary. Exactly. Uh, the tips are what the tips are. Mm -hmm. If it was a local media only, mm -hmm. it would be much easier to work. Yeah. When you make also, keep in mind the way that she's talking about her dad in this particular interview because later on, you'll find out that she decided to plan a, like an accusation about how he's actually a pedo even though he's not. and. It's like a very crafted story for them to try and gain sympathy during the trial. To this day, she also says that the allegations are true. And the way that she's acting about her dad in this instance when she's asking after his health, it just shows that that's... I don't even know how to describe it at that point. I, I'm just upset. <laughs> Kaylee's remains were found in December of 2008, so this is the same year that this whole thing started. She was in a bag, she had duct tape over her nose and mouth, so like suffocation, and she was in the swamp that was nearby to the house. On the day of her disappearance, Casey had actually searched on Google things like how to suffocate a child or suffocation methods and stuff like that. So they had those searches and now she turns up clearly being suffocated with the tape over her mouth. She was also seen on the same day of the disappearance at a blockbuster with her boyfriend and Kaylee was not inside. Kaylee was not accounted for in any other place at that time as well, so that's very suspicious. Also during this period, Casey was out partying and she even got a tattoo that said the good life on it while she was having fun while her daughter was missing. In her diary, they also found entries that were very vague stating things like, I'm very happy with the decision that I made and I hope that my life will get even better from now and I'm very happy with what I'm doing while Kaylee was missing and also very vague statements about the thing that she did like the the decision that she made that was a very big decision now this is what I find interesting because when I write in my journal I actually am very specific because with my whole thing it's like 
I'm the one who's talking about stuff in there. It's for me. And then when I'm when I'm older, I'm gonna come back to it and read about the times that you know I wrote in the journal and what was going on in my life. Sometimes I'll even put like little landmarks and stuff in there, like today the temperature was this and because the date's this and like i'm currently feeling like this and you know very specific things so this in particular makes me feel like she was either very aware that someone was going to try and look into her diary because people would realize that kaylee's missing and they were trying to conduct some sort of investigation so she was trying to be vague so that they wouldn't catch her admitting in her diary that she killed her daughter or another thing that i think might be more likely the case is that with stuff like this we tend to try and separates the reality of the situation by like not directly referring to it so maybe even though casey is definitely like she, she has no remorse she's shown that she has no remorse she definitely thinks that what happened was a good thing she still might be kind of coping with the weird sort of not not guilt but just like the severity of what she did to the point where if she directly says that she murdered her daughter it would kind of catch up with her in a way mentally so she's just saying the thing that i did in her own mind like she doesn't want to directly state what she did even to herself maybe that might be more accurate to why she's so vague in her own diary so she was in jail for about two years from this point and the actual proper trial was in 2011 it was on may 24th and this is when we see Jose in all of his shitty glory. One of the things that was actually brought up during the investigation was that it was definitely Casey that had searched for those things on Google, like the suffocation and stuff, because she was logging into her MySpace account and it was like no one else had access to her MySpace account besides her. So at one point, Cindy actually tried to cover up for her and was like, no, I misspelled a word. I didn't actually mean to look that up, but I was the one who looked that up by accident. And then she rescinded this afterwards and said that she was trying to cover up for Casey, which just to me shows how manipulative someone can be and then how someone can almost have like Stockholm syndrome as as a like a result of the relationship where it's like no I have to protect my daughter even though your daughter is like happily gonna frame you for murder if she needs to but there's still that kind of relationship that you have and it's very hard to break out of so they call Jeffrey Jeffrey's on the stand and he says that he doesn't even know a Zanny he doesn't know a nanny because he doesn't have kids he barely knows Casey they didn't even work that much together at all like what why did she think that this would work she also reiterates that she went to go to Zanny's apartment to pick up Kaylee no one answered the door and then Kaylee and Zanny had taken her somewhere and she knew that Zanny had her and then all this weird shit that doesn't make sense and the timeline is already so confusing because it's like she admitted that she didn't work at Universal. She had, she had worked at Universal in reality at some point, but she didn't actually work in the place that she said. So not only did she lie about when she worked there, but she lied about what she did for some reason. I don't know why. You are stupid. Yes, I know. That's insulting, but it's also the truth. Editing Tara here to say that I put the footage for my shop channel in as the visuals because my camera wasn't cooperating for the rest of this. I'm really sorry about that. So the timeline is that Casey saw is for suffocation on Google, murders Kaylee, keeps her in the car for a few days, and then dumps her body and starts making up a story about it while she goes out partying, stays at friends' places and her boy and her boyfriend's place to keep her out of parents' sight so they don't question her about Kaylee. And if they do question her, then she can hang up on them. So she has the control in the communication. Then a meter reader for the neighborhood finds Kaylee's body in a swamp and calls the police. He was a regular to read that neighborhood, so he was able to find it and he knew his way around the area once he found something that made him suspicious and he said that what he found looked like a child's skull so then it kind of snowballed from there during the trial casey was just shaking her head the entire time that the prosecutor was talking and jose her shithead attorney who we'll get into some other time is slimy so slimy in the way that he manipulated the entire jury to see Casey as not guilty. One of the ways that he did this was that they made up this lie together that she was raped by her dad, George Anthony, when she was a child, and that she was scared that Kaylee was going to get the same treatment. ...that you've made in your jury service and coming here and helping us see justice. We know it's no easy task, and we intend, I'm sure both sides, on getting you homeless quickly as possible once you have all of the information that you need. Everyone wants to know what happened. How in the world can a mother wait 30 days before ever reporting her child missing? It's insane. It's bizarre. Something's just not right about that. 
Well, the answer is actually relatively simple. She never was missing. Kaylee Anthony died on June 16, 2008, when she drowned in her family's swimming pool. Well, the reason we're all here is because not of the commonality of this tragedy, but of the uniqueness of the family that it happened to. You will hear about ugly things, secret things, things that people don't speak about, things that Casey never spoke about. On June 16, 2008, after Kaylee died, Casey did what she's been doing all her life, or for most of it, hiding her pain, going into that dark corner and pretending that she does not live in, in the situation that she's living in. This family must keep its secrets quiet. And it all began when Casey was eight years old and her father came into her room and began to touch her inappropriately. This child, who was at eight years old, learned to lie immediately. She could be 13 years old, have her father's penis in her mouth, and then go to school and play with the other kids as if nothing ever happened. That will help you understand why no one knew that her child was dead. They basically say that Casey just did what she did because she's a victim and made up a false sub story around her so that the jury would fall for it. Sounds pretty frustrating, right? And you'd immediately think that the jury is a bunch of morons for actually finding her not guilty. How retarded do you have to be to see Casey as innocent? Well, part of the blame is actually on the prosecution because as I was frustrated as you are, but I found that the prosecution didn't use all the facts and they were actually operating in a very incompetent way, even though a child killer was on the line here. Even Jose, for a later interview, says that he was waiting for them to bring up the Google searches and realized that they're not gonna bring them up. They're not gonna bring up the fact that she searched for how to kill a child with suffocation. And then he realized that he was basically gonna win the case. So they didn't do their jobs. It would be so easy to cast blame through the injustice that you're feeling on just the jury members. And But I have to say that imagine being a jury member and you don't have all the facts and then someone who's very good at manipulation comes along and convinces you otherwise and then you vote not guilty and then when you're leaving the courthouse you immediately regret your decision but you can't really do anything about it because you don't know if the other jury members feel the same or if you're going insane and I, I understand that. And However, I will say that some of the court members being interviewed still stick by their decision years later for some fucking reason, and that sounds really fucking stupid even though they know all the facts now and, and they're just... <laughs> I blame those guys, but I don't blame everyone else. Maybe you should join Majestic 12 in a body bag. I have some good news for both of you. Okay. Around June in 2021, someone threw a drink at Casey at a club in Florida and she called 911. She called them immediately, actually, for th someone throwing a drink at her in a club, even though she never called them when her child was missing. In 2016, Casey had a bankruptcy case going on, so she had to go back to court, and there's a document containing information from this detective who actually worked on Jose's team during the actual murder trial, and it has some really interesting things. According to the document, it said that Casey and Jose would make remarks like, Kaylee isn't going to be found and they need to get used to that, and we could say that the meter reader kidnapped her, the meter reader being the one who found the body, remember? Jose himself was also incredibly weird and unprofessional. The detective that was on the defense team said so much stuff that I can't even put all of it into this video, but I'm gonna link this video by Annie Lee's Ten to Life, where she actually shows the document and reads a lot of it in full so you can really understand the horrible things that were happening here. But the main things that were sticking out for my video's purpose, that Jose said that he knew something was up with her and something was wrong with her, but he refused to have her evaluated by a health professional. He also knew that she did something, and Kate Casey ended up providing Jose with ominously vague items and photos that he could sell because she had no money to pay for his services and she was using this as like a barter thing for him to help her during the trial. When the police offered a plea deal, Jose told her not to do anything about it and to wait for him to come back from his trip. And even when Casey wanted to arrange a meeting with the police to go through with this plea deal, the, uh, an associate of Jose's came to stop them and refused to let it happen. So he had someone on his behalf basically harass them to stop the plea deal from happening. Jose once said, you owe me three blowjobs. 
meaning the nature of their relationship, and how she was paying for his services. She was also very fixated on whether the meter reader had found everything yet, because basically it made it look like she knew that there was more evidence around where Kaylee was dumped in the swamp, and was waiting to see if the reader had looked around the area more than it appeared that he had. This detective also witnessed Casey being naked in Jose's office more than once because of an arrangement that she had. Jose even admitted to the detective that Casey did kill Kaylee. The detective was even threatened with implication in Kaylee's murder and like if you say anything about what's going on here we're gonna frame you and the meter reader for covering up the body for some reason. So obviously because of all of these weird things that were happening he was afraid to speak out until this point. Again there are way more details but I'm gonna leave that video in the description where she breaks it down really well but finally we get to the point of this video which is the Peacock documentary. You are stupid. Yes, I know. That's insulting, but it's also the truth. I think what I'm about to get into really highlights the disturbing relationship that the media has with true crime events. In the Kyle Rittenhouse case, for example, the trial proved that he was an individual who wanted to help protect his friend's property and was forced into acting into self-defense because of the situation he was in and the fact that the people around him were trying to attack him. This was proven because in the trial, one of the people that he had a tussle with was even directly saying that he was actually trying to attack Kyle and Kyle had to protect himself. And the footage was studied very closely and showed that this is definitely true. Yet, because of some political things that were involved, the media decided to portray the exact opposite situation. They said that he was hunting people and killing them, and they even helped one of the perpetrators cover up their own admittance. That perpetrator in the court who said that he was actually going to attack Kyle, the media almost tried to cover it up for him and said that, you know, he was just walking around doing his thing. The fallout is that a lot of people f are still fighting over this case for stupid political reasons when it should just be a cut and dry case of the truth and not really politics. It's the thing about justice here, it's not about what your random stupid bedroom politics are. So in the similar instance, Casey is clearly guilty and said things that show her true personality and lied and admitted that she lied expressly, yet Peacock comes in and says, that she that there's more to the story and helps her cover up her own instances of lying and delivers the direct opposite story of the truth in this case. Now you could say that the media is just lying for money and there's nothing to it, there's no personal investment that they have, they're just rage baiting to generate money and attention in both of these examples. If you don't know what rage baiting is, it's like doing something that purposefully makes someone angry because they're more likely to engage with the material and share it to other people if they're angry. And yes, that's true. But my problem is that these actions don't exist in a vacuum. Sure, they're only lying for money, but the damage is done, and that damage is that a lot of people see this false information as truth, and they believe it so passionately, whether it be through personal experiences that they feel tie them to this case, or political reasons that they feel like they have to draw lines with other people, that people's lives are ruined and the justice system is more muddy than it already is. In this documentary, Casey goes into doubling down about George being a pedophile even though it's not true, and as a result he admits in his own interview, and I'll talk about this later, that he frequently contemplates committing suicide. He is so distraught and broken because not only did his granddaughter die, but his daughter betrayed him. He gets calls from idiots who believe that Casey is innocent, calling him pedo and moron and leaving all sorts of horrible messages to an innocent man. Money or not, Peacock fueled that treatment of innocent grandparents that were just trying to mourn the loss of their granddaughter and caught in an impossible situation. In November of 2022, the streaming service Peacock did this horrible documentary called Casey Anthony, Where the Truth Lies, where they interview her with these softball questions that she already knew was coming. Now we know this because Nancy Grace was actually originally supposed to be interviewing her, she was asked to do so, but Nancy says that they were not letting her ask the questions that she wanted to, and she had to basically make sure that Casey understood what was happening so that she had lies prepared in advance and that Nancy was not allowed to challenge her on any of those. That I was contacted by this group <laughs> when the director was still working on it to have a sit down with Tottenham Casey Anthony under these conditions and I said absolutely not. She didn't agree to the conditions. Listen, I know some people, not Nancy, Nancy Grace fans, but basically what she's saying is she knew that they were trying to drive this documentary in one direction. She told them to go fuck themselves and I am here for it. 
So they basically let Casey run the show and come up with any lie that she wants and paint it as though Casey is innocent and there are genuinely some idiots going around. I don't know if they're hypersophiliacs or not, but they believe that Casey is innocent because of this stupid documentary. The whole premise of the documentary is that Casey is now revealing bombshells that she never told the defense, her own team, for some reason. And I don't know why. This also goes back to if she was really that worried about Kaylee, why did she spend so much time lying to those detectives? Why would Casey reveal bombshells in this documentary about the case when she should have revealed them during the court case if it would prove her innocence so quickly back then? All of it sounds like she had more than 10 years to come up with some new lies and someone gave her a platform to say these things in a very controlled setting. She insists that Zanny the nanny was a real nanny, but not her nanny, and that the lies that she told were based on the truth as if it should make her look better? So? Good liars use the truth to back themselves up, to look more legit, all the time. You're trying to convince me that the sky is green and the moon is made out of cheese? That would make your lie seem pretty bullshit and I would believe that you were lying immediately. But if you had some truth there and it actually sounded really believable because half of the stuff you're saying was true, you are more likely to trick me. That's just the way that lies work on a basic level. Saying that you did tell a bit of the truth doesn't make you look like a good person or a better person because obviously you were trying to sell the lies. You weren't being more honest just because you were trying to sell the lies in a better way. And what is your relationship to truth and lying? Why are you locked in the bathroom? What's your relationship with the truth? What kind of question is that? What does that mean? Then she explains that the emotionless nature that she showed during the other footage that I played, like the interviews and, and the interrogation, was her in survival mode and that she didn't want to break down on camera. Was her only caring about herself and not giving anyone else information also going into survival mode for herself? Yes. But for Kaylee, <laughs> not so much. She said that the tattoo that she got that says the good life was actually an ironic tattoo because it was a way to rebel her against her abusive parents because of them not supporting her and her dad being a pedophile, I guess. And now she's covered it up with some shit that looks like it's, it's from like an MLM. <laughs> you are stupid. She talks about herself like how she felt when her kid was missing was more important than her kid actually being missing. Like what she was thinking and how she looked to other people was more important than the fact that Kaylee could have been dead at any moment and none of her family knew. Even Casey's brother said that Casey told him that Zanny held her down and kidnapped Kaylee in Orlando in plain sight. And this is what she said in court. And even when the body was recovered, she still kept up this apparent holding down and kidnapping scenario that she even told to lie to her own brother. She kept that story for some, in, some time, and it seems like she kept it up all the way until the Peacock documentary aired where she suddenly changes her story and says that that was never the case. She acts as if the lies that she told were told by someone else and now she's pissed off because she has to clear the air and clear up the mess. You were the one that perpetrated those lies in the first place. When she was asked about where Zanny lives, she was like, this is where Zanny allegedly lives and she looks really pissed off to say this, but you were the one that made this up. You were the one that said that she lived there. You were the one that made this whole nonsense in the first place. Why are you acting like someone else did that? It's Zenaida Gonzalez or Zanny the Nanny as she was referred to was- <laughs> This just sounds like bullshit. Allegedly living. What the so the new story is that Casey said that she wanted a night out and took Kaylee along to hang out with her friends and do the, all the night out things that she did, but lied to her parents that she left Kaylee at a babysitter because she didn't actually want to leave Kaylee with her parents because her dad is allegedly a molester and was going to rape Kaylee otherwise. She really goes ham on the George is a rapist angle when she's lied about everything else. So why wouldn't she lie about this? Why would it suddenly be the truth that George is a rapist? She also said that she was raped or unaware of who the father was. So Kaylee is the result of really degenerate or unscrupulous things that happened to her. But now she's saying that she does know who did it and the, the weird thing about this that other people have pointed out is that she said that she remembered absolutely nothing from that night. Not one bit. Absolutely nothing from the time that she got pregnant and now she has Kaylee. But why does she now remember specific details yet she also is maintaining that she remembers nothing? She said what really happened that night was that Kaylee was sleeping in the room with Casey at her parents house where she lived in the bedroom that they had and Kaylee was always the type of person to tell Casey whenever she was leaving the room and whatever she was doing and one night she didn't do that and Casey wakes up in a panic because Kaylee isn't with her 
So then she goes out into the rest of the house and she sees her dad pulling Kaylee out of the pool and the dad is screaming Casey about how this is all her fault and then immediately switches up to start starting to comfort her and saying, we'll sort this out, we're gonna sort this out. Casey reiterates that Kaylee would never leave her side, which as someone who has worked with a bunch of like two-year-olds and babies and four-year-olds, even the four-year-olds, I had to tell them multiple times to like, like, where are you going? What are you, what the fuck are you doing? You know, and it, obviously I wasn't swearing at them, but you know what I mean? Like, they, children don't act that way. They act in their own world. They kind of assume that everyone else knows what they're doing automatically and they just go and do it. And then that, that's why you have to look after them. The amount of times where it's like, you can't go outside yet. You're not supposed to go outside yet. You're supposed to be in the room. And then they just go and try and open the door. They, they'll go somewhere else and you're like, where the fuck are you going? And, and they're like, no, I have to go to the bathroom. It's like, why didn't you tell me? Like, go. <laughs> you can't just two year two year olds don't act like that. Even four year olds don't act like that. Also, Kaylee was found with duct tape around her face, aka, you know, the suffocation thing that was happening. In this documentary, Casey does not address the duct tape. She isn't even asked about it, I think. And she says that her dad was the one who Googled suffocation later that day, even though according to her new story. Kaylee was found dead in the early morning, so why, if she's already dead, would he Google that when she's dead? I don't get it. Also, he was not home at the time, because like I said, search has happened in not only Casey's MySpace, so like, it was her account. He was at work, and if he searched it at work, in a completely different place with a completely different IP address, the work would have shown this. Like, they would monitor what he was searching. That's what workplaces do. So what is up with that? So how did he do that? How did he go to a completely different place, go and make search histories on someone else's account that he didn't know the password to, and then go back to his workplace in a, the amount of time that doesn't make any sense, and then afterwards call home to say that the car was impounded. Even Cindy, Casey's mom, was trying to cover for her at one point, saying that the searches were made by Cindy by accident because Cindy misspelled a word. And then she came out and said that she actually lied about that and she was just trying to cover up for Casey because both of them are used to covering up for Casey's lies and they're used to being pushover. So who, who did it then? Did Cindy do it? Did George do it? Why would George look up some nonsense? Even though the drowning story was the story that happened and Casey said that Kaylee was already dead by that point. She also kind of infers that maybe George happened to be the one that actually killed Kaylee because he was trying to rape her and she was fighting back somehow or something. But even if that's the case, why would he then go and look up the method of death way afterwards as if he was planning to kill her when she was already dead? It, it doesn't make any sense to me. And, and why would the prosecutors not use the searches for evidence? I, I just- Casey is doing an entire Crash Bandicoot level of gymnastics around this story and none of it makes any sense. Casey then claims that she only came out about the George story during the trial because she was only then getting flashbacks about how she was raped as a kid and she only remembered it then. So she went from being totally normal about him to suddenly acting like he's the crow mauler in like the course of a year. And she claims that her dad was assaulting Kaylee, so she needed to protect her, and then this whole thing happened. Then, after that point, after she said that this is what her version of events is about the pool and all of that, later on, she says that her new version of events is that Kaylee was fighting George off because George was trying to do bad things, and then he tried to knock her out by smothering her, so he accidentally kills her that morning while Casey is asleep. Somehow she ends up in the pool, somehow she's wet, which Casey then ignores in her new version of events, and then the duct tape is, is not mentioned either. Then she, he was googling how to kill toddler when the toddler was already dead and he was already at work and he couldn't have been searching it from that area. Am I just... Am I just going insane? Now, the reason why she thinks that she has evidence to call George a pedophile is because he gave this eulogy for Kaylee where it seems creepy out of context. He says creepy sounding things out of context, but it's so obvious that he is just a sentimental man who doesn't understand how to communicate himself properly. So many of you that never got a chance to actually hug her, smell her hair, smell the sweet sweat when she came in from outside. He doesn't know how to put his thoughts on paper in a way that makes sense, so to us, it sounds like he's saying something that he's obviously not meaning. He's not meaning that he misses creepy things about her, like the smell of her sweat in like a weird way. He's trying to paint a very vivid picture of the memory of a human being. And human beings are complex, we have a lot of stuff about us, and what he's trying to say is that 
every single bit of Kaylee is burned into his brain because she was a family member. Like, he misses every single bit of those memories because he knows he's never going to have any more with her. That's what he was trying to say. But she is using this grieving man, her own father, as an excuse for the shit that she did. Now, I don't know that much about the producers, I only know that they worked on reality TV before making this, so this is clearly just like an outrage thing, it's a rage bait, but still, again, like I said, it's not excusable. This year, at the time of recording, 2024, in January, a documentary dropped off about Casey's parents. Casey's parents were doing a lie detector and basically exposing Casey in like an interview style thing from another source. This is basically like a reply to the documentary that Peacock dropped. I is the daughter the two of you raised making the cruelest accusation against her father. Because she found out that he was the main witness for the grand jury against her. The only other witness besides the sheriff's department, detectives that were out to get her, and now her father's out to get her. Jose got interviewed by Megan Kelly and Megan Kelly, sorry, Australian accent. And he's ugh, he's such a shitbag. He's like, you weren't there, you don't know. Were you there? Did, did you kill Kaylee, Jose? You are stupid. Cindy says that she's been going through a lot of anxiety because, you know, obviously, and she even has an anxiety attack on camera and breaks down because of the stress when she's talking about Casey's lying and all of the stuff that she had to go through. They also turned Kaylee's room into a memorial room and a craft room so that Cindy can spend time in Kaylee's memory and sort of honor her while she's doing her hobbies and finding peace with herself, which I think is very sweet. They also say that they believe that Kaylee's ghost is in the house and obviously this is like a sore subject because my brain is like, oh, you can't, you know, that that's not true. But at the same time, they're grieving and I don't want to be an asshole. So if they saw Kaylee's ghost in the house and they believe that she's with them, she's with them. Th this is not one of those videos that I make where I scream at ghost hunters on the internet. This is not the time for that. They also heard about the Peacock documentary when it dropped and they thought that she was being disgusting for doing that because they heard some of what was happening but they, for their own peace of mind, had no idea what the extent of it was because they refused to watch it. They didn't want to engage in it. So they didn't actually know what was happening until they started getting horrible accusations thrown at them and they didn't even know through those accusations what the true extent of what Casey said was until this actual documentary about the lie detector interview and stuff because in this documentary they watch the peacock one and it's very clear how hurt they are because no matter what when you think that Casey has done enough to hurt them she somehow does even more and I feel so bad for them. So only now in this documentary are they hearing that Casey is telling everyone that George is a rapist pedophile and they, they get harassment from brainlets on social media who just take it and believe it without any of the context showing why it's bullshit. It seems to me that they're finally realizing not to be pushovers and finally finding their voices to explain that she's a bullshitter and they shouldn't be looking after her and they shouldn't be bailing her out. But it's kind of like a too little too late type of situation because they're already in such a bad Bad place because of you know what Casey did and the the lie that got out of hand and all of this nonsense they they look so tired and I I would be so tired too George seems very nervous because obviously if you have people scrutinizing your every move as an innocent man you start to feel like maybe am I guilty of something I don't understand I don't know how to act normal anymore like it's obvious the effect that it's having on him sociologically psycho like I, I, oh my god I don't I can't even speak Cindy also looks really distant, like she's somewhere else, and I don't blame her either. They were basically asked about the assault and Kaylee's whereabouts and all of that, and in the lie detector test, I know that lie detectors are kind of bullshit anyway, so it's like, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to say that this is something that needed to be proved with a lie detector test or that the lie detector test does anything in particular, but it did come back for both of them that they, they are innocent from the lie detector test standards. Again. I, I don't need the lie detector to tell me that, but <laughs> but it also looks like they're not really dealing with their trauma in healthy ways because they don't really know how. Because at one point, Cindy starts yelling at the camera crew and whatnot, and she's just having this random outburst that's clearly coming from somewhere else, but she hasn't been able to 
articulate what's really happening so it's coming out as anger and like i said about george he's shifting around because he doesn't know what to do with himself anymore and he doesn't really have an outlet to understand how to act or how to do anything so it's just like jittery mess basically they said that they also don't know who the father of kaylee is because casey never told them and she always changed the story that she did tell them which sounds about right and cindy realizes that she's been way too lenient on casey and george of like george is just kind of distant this whole time as well and i really don't blame him but cindy also points out that casey and george know cpr so the pool story doesn't really make sense because they found kaylee according to casey they didn't really do anything they kind of just like oh whoops and then it's just that that's just the way it is but that doesn't seem like it would happen according to cindy and now we get to where we are today all in all i am kind of speechless <laughs> like like I said, it, this stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum, and it is so infuriating to listen to. We still have time, like, you can still treat it like a cold case, and we still have time to maybe, like, have another court case. Maybe one day Casey will go to jail, because it will come to light, and there will be a proper prosecutor that isn't a complete moron who leaves out evidence. Maybe, and maybe there will. But at the same time, it's like... <sighs> Thank you for listening to me ramble about nonsense, and uh, I'll see you next time.